Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guest today is guitar player and film composer Lyle Workman. First of all, Nielsen released its total audience survey just recently. Now, Nielsen actually has a lot of surveys, a lot of reports, and for the most part, they're pretty interesting. They're all about media and how we consume them. This one is across all platforms, which is unusual because normally they concentrate on just one platform, be it radio or television or streaming or whatever. But this is across all platforms. And here's what they found. Well, first of all, U.S. adults consume 11 hours of media per day. That means they're on their computer, television, smartphone, whatever, for 11 hours a day. That's pretty amazing. Now, there's a lot of info about how we consume television, and I'll just give you a little bit of that. So, for instance, two-thirds of us, and this is adults in the United States, own some sort of streaming device for television, and 88% time shift their viewing. In other words, use an HDR or some sort of outboard device to actually stream your video and watch programs after the fact, after they've been broadcast. So we've been into streaming audio for a long time, and now it's really hitting video pretty hard. And it's actually not a bad thing. It's just that we're changing our consumption habits. Now, this is what I found interesting. Radio reaches 92% of all U.S. adults per week. 92% of us listen to radio sometime during the week. Yeah, that makes sense because most of us drive, and what do we do when we drive? We put on the radio at least for a few minutes. So you would think that radio would be having a big comeback and would be more influential than ever, but in fact, that's not the case. And one of the reasons why is it actually has the lowest discovery of new product of any kind of consumption format. So what that means is any kind of new music you're probably not going to hear on the radio or you're going to get it someplace else first. And we're seeing that streaming networks are very influential to radio these days as radio programmers actually look and see what people are consuming online and then that influences their decision and what to put in the on-air playlist. Now, one of the things I look at that I don't see anywhere, but I think is really a big factor in all this. Sure, 92% of adults per week listen to radio. How many of those actually listen to music? A lot of this is news, for instance, or talk radio or sports. So I would bet that if we were to break that down, we'd find music was actually falling behind the others where once upon a time, music and radio went hand in hand. You listen to radio to consume music. That doesn't happen so much anymore. Another big trend is that smart speakers are taking over. Now, gradually, but they're really picking up speed. 19% of all U.S. households now own a smart speaker. And it says here that by the end of the year, 90 million people in the United States will have used a smart speaker. The good thing is smart speakers are making us listen more. And people that actually own a smart speaker say that they listen to about 71% more audio than they ever did before. One of the things that manufacturers really like about this is the fact that algorithms are replacing user interface controls. So in other words, instead of having expensive controls on a device that you can tune into a station, tune into a streaming network with a display. All these are very expensive to manufacture. If you can just speak what you want and an algorithm can understand and then get you what you want, that's a whole lot cheaper. So now we see manufacturers really like smart devices and we're going to see more and more of those finally one last thing 43 percent of all u.s households now own a streaming device so everyone that said the streaming would never catch on well it looks like you were wrong If you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyowindercircle.com. Just a heads up that my new book, The Music Business Advice Book, is now available. It's comprised of 150 immediately useful tips compiled from the interviews from this podcast. 
You'll find it on Amazon and most other online book retailers, as well as a bookstore near you. Now, some audio news. Logitech, the computer accessories company, just acquired Blue Microphones for $117 million. Blue was actually owned by the private equity firm, the Riverside Company, which is a big company. They've invested in about 80 different companies, including DPA microphones and screen vision. And they had bought Blue Microphones in 2013 from Transom Capital, another private equity firm. So we can see that more and more audio companies are getting involved with private equity, mostly so the owners can cash out, I would think. And it seems like it's a trend for sure. But now that Logitech has acquired Blue, that's kind of interesting because Blue actually fits very well with Logitech. Considering that even though Blue Microphones has 30 different products and various microphones and headphones and whatever, the really big killer product that they have is the USB microphones, and that's perfect for Logitech. So it should be interesting to see what happens here. I think it's a good fit. The other thing to think about is Logitech also owns Ultimate Ears, the in-ear monitor company. And in fact, they've thrived under Logitech. So hopefully Blue Microphones will do the same. They make some great product. And again, every time there's an acquisition in the professional audio business or the musical instrument business, I always keep my fingers crossed. And I hope that if nothing else, the company gets better rather than worse or gets gutted, as we've seen happen in the past. But I think, in fact, Blue Microphones is going to be in good hands, at least in the near future. Lyle Workman has a long history as a guitar player and songwriter, first as a member of Bourgeois Tag, and then with Todd Rundgren, Beck, and Sting, as well as doing tons of sessions. These days, he's thriving as a film and television composer with movies like Superbad, The 40-Year-Old Virgin, and Bad Santa 2, and television shows like Love and Crashing Under His Belt. In the interview, Lyle talked about his background, playing with Beck and Sting, and making the transition from player to composer, among many other things. We spoke via Skype from his home in Glendale, California. Let's go back to the beginning. I don't know much about your background. I know you since you got into town, but I don't know much about you before then. How did you get into business, music business? Uh, part of the business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I've got a bit of a, I got a different bit of a, you know, my trajectory is a little uh, oblique because I, I moved, well, I grew up in the Bay area and, um, just playing in bands, playing guitar and rock bands, rock, pop, whatever. Uh, and you know, I went to college for a couple of years there and, and studied music theory and jazz harmony and, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, and then taught at a music store for, for a few years and then ended up uh, getting into a band that got signed to Island Records. That was in like, 1986 or 87, I should say. Mm-hmm. And that was back with Blue Watch Ag. And we had a couple, you know, a couple singles. We did some touring. Our, our, we were managed by Bill Graham Presents. So we had some really good touring opportunities to open up for bands that had big hits at the time. Yeah. You know, we did a tour with Robert Palmer when he had Addicted to Love and we did another one with Hart, you know, did some stuff with Aha and The Fix and, you know, his opening band. But then we, then we had a, a single, a single that uh, I wrote with the singer and uh, had some pretty good success with that. And we did The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and, you know, the, American Bandstand and Top of the Pops and then Equivalents and in, 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 uh, Abroad. So that was a pretty great experience. Wow. We banned, uh, just, we, our last record, we had, we, did, we made two records for, for Ireland and the second record was produced by Todd Rundgren. Um, and after that, Todd was working on his own record and asked our band to be his backup band. And as well as enlisting some other local Bay Area musicians at that time, Todd was living in Sausalito, and and I uh, was still in Sacramento 
that's where the band was based, my, my band. And around that time, working with Todd, our band disbanded. And I ended up moving over to Todd's camp and, and recording and touring with him for a few years. We did a few records. And actually, uh, three of us from Blue Shore Tag ended up doing that with Todd. And then, you know, after that, uh, I was working on my own material. I decided I wanted to stay home and, and, and work on my own material. I mean, at the time, you know, I'd written pop stuff, and, and, but I'd, oh, I'd always had a tape recorded. I was always messing around with, with uh, my guitar and, you know, drum machines and bass and little keyboard stuff. So, you know, I started out having, a, you know, an eight-track reel-to-reel and then a no, oh, sorry, a four a four track wheel to reel I had when I was around eighteen years old, and then and, you know it just kind of got bigger and bigger. I went from a four track to an eight track, to a Porta Studio, to a, a sixteen track half half inch machine. You know, I always had gear, and I always wanted to write and record. I really didn't know what I was, where I was really heading with it. Whether I wanted to, you know, sort of. And I, I was never in a, uh, I, ne- I was never of the mindset to, to sort of pick a lane. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I was just interested in, in all kinds of things. I mean, I, I loved the pop music of the day, but I also was into, you know, into progressive rock and, you know, Frank Zappa and, and, you know, jazz and jazz fusion and, and classical music. And so I was always just kind of goofing around recording and writing bits and pieces. And I ended up doing an instrumental record. Uh, well, I've actually, at, by, at this point, I've done, I've done three. I'm working on a fourth one. Uh, but I was teaching myself production, engin- production and engineering kind of early on. And I just sort of kept that going. And, and little did I know that was going to really uh, help me in my career now, which is primarily as a composer for film and TV. Of course, having experience with Todd Rundgren is a big deal. You know, just to look over his shoulder, I would think. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a certain thing that happens to your musicality when you get in when you get in inside someone's music and you and you play it and you learn it and you hear how it's all put together. It was a, a bit of a master class working with him sure. because you know, in my mind, I think in the mind of many, he's a he's a musical genius and a true original. So. Uh, we did we did a couple records. Both the first record we did was called Nearly Human, and it was recorded live, live in a studio. We did it uh, fantasy in Berkeley, and I think we did some, we did some at the record plant there too. I believe that's where it was, and it was just the idea was no overdubs. Mm. <laughs> I love it. That's great. Yeah. So we had a you know big uh, again. It was our the the three guys from uh, the band I was in and outfitted with singers and a sax player and a flute and a percussionist and, and a, a group of singers and whatever the, whatever the music called for. And then the second record we did was called Second Wind, which was an interesting concept. We, we recorded live on stage. We did this at the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco. And we re- he recorded, we did five nights in a row but the way that the proceedings were was set up as a recording studio on a stage, you know, on a, uh, at the at the venue. Yeah. And so people were instructed not to, you know, make noise or not to even clap until they gave them a signal. And the way that we were set up on we were set up as if it was a recording studio. So people were sitting down, and uh, there were gobos and and between certain things and you know, for sound isolation. So it was like watching a play of a, of a recording studio, essentially. And, uh, you know, it's kind of great because it, you know, kind of helped finance the project, number one, but also, you know, you got the feel of the live audience there, but you're, it's a recording session, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Wow. That's awesome. So you're watching the recording session. Yeah. A full on, you know, full, uh, audience of, uh, of fans watching it. So that was really fun. And, some of that music was uh, from a play that Todd had written the music for, called Up Against It. So it was some pretty theatrical stuff and some, you know, some sophisticated material. And but yeah, just in, in short, yes, when you work with 
Todd Rundgren, you know, some stuff's going to rub off and it's <laughs> going to be really good. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Okay, so how did you get to Los Angeles then? Well, after that, I, uh, at that, that my wife and I, we, we live, we're living in uh, Marin County and it's kind of had a period of not doing much other than just working on my own material and I think I had a publishing deal and, and, you know, trying to play songs and things like that. And then a couple of cool things happened. I, I, uh, I worked on a record by this band Jellyfish. I don't know if you've heard that, that oh, band sure. before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, because they, they, some of the guys in that band were in another band that opened up for my band, or the band I was in, Bush White Tag, back in that, at that time. And, and I was just a big fan. I heard their first record. I thought that it was just incredible music. In fact, I thought it was a band from England. Yeah. yeah. Little did I know they were, you know, basically there, right there, the Bay Area. So I, I, Bought them out and, and offered my services, and they they took me up. They took my offer, <laughs> <laughs> and I ended ended up recording uh, the record "Spilt Milk" here in L.A. That was around 1991, I believe, 1992. And then just doing a, you know, I did a little stint touring with an artist named Jude Cole. Oh sure, that yeah. was really fun. Yeah, and then did uh, and then the, a longer lasting, substantial gig was. Came shortly after that, I started working with the artist Frank Black, who was in the Pixies. Sure, yeah, who was the central songwriter and singer, and and that uh, lasted for about five years of recording and touring, you know, all over. Towards the end of that run, I, you know, I realized that pretty much my life was w- working with him, touring and being gone for long periods of time. I think one we had one tour that was like seven months or something. Mm to that fact, it was, it was very long. So I decided, well, I might as well just moved along. So I had been thinking about moving to Los Angeles for the past, you know, since, since 1990 or so, once the band broke up that I was in. And so moving to Los Angeles for 1997, and actually 90, yeah, 96. And the idea then was that, well, I would play with, uh, I was continuing to play with, with Frank Black, but I also wanted to, to explore more session work and that's pretty much what I did. You know, just meeting, I'd, I had a, it was a producer, Matt Wallace, that I'd known from the Bay Area, and he was kind enough to to um, hire me on some records he was working on at the time. And, you know, word got around and word of mouth. And so I started doing more session, more session work at that time. I saw your credits, uh, your session credits. I didn't realize how diverse the artists were that you work with. Gee, Michael Bubbly, and then to Ziggy Marley, then to Nora Jones, Cheryl Crow. Wow, it's way different. Yeah. You know, I think that goes back to what I was saying earlier, that I, I've, I've just been a fan. I'm a, I am a fan of all kinds of music. You know, and, and it's just my experiences of working with lots of different artists have given me a, a bit of versatility in that area. And then, you know, you start doing you start doing these working with these artists and you just get inside their world. You know, you, 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 that's what you do as musicians. You interpret the music and, and learn what makes it tick. And, and yeah, so the, the, the diverse range of musicians and and artists I worked with was really, uh, very helpful. How did Beck come about? Uh, Beck came about, it was, uh, I'd done one of the sessions I I did in here in LA was, for Rick Rubin, and he was producing the Sporty Spice. I think her name was Mel yeah. C. Yeah, the yeah, Spice yeah. Girls. Yeah. And on that session was Roger Manning from Jellyfish and uh, Justin Meldow Johnson, uh, who both were playing in Beck's band. And the drummer was Victor and Drizzo. And uh, and shortly after that session, I got a call to audition. Roger, Roger and Justin have been playing with Beck for a few years by then. And, uh, I actually ended up auditioning with Victor, the same drummer at the Mel C session. And we both got the gig. And then that, you know, that led to about two years of touring. That's very cool. But then I don't know how you transitioned to that, but then you got the gig with Sting. How did that happen? I mean, how does one go about getting a gig with Sting? Well, well, everything has been word of mouth. It really has been for me word of mouth. 
if I hearken back to Matt Wallace, producer Matt Wallace, who hired me to play on a couple records, one of the records was a band called uh, Khalil, and Josh Freeze was drumming on that. And so I think that's where I met Josh Freeze, I believe, yeah. And so, you know, musicians, you know, when you, when you work with a musician and you, you hit it off, it's just a beautiful thing. Yeah. You want you want to be around that, and they want to be around you. And if you're if you're good, you know they 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 have no, you know they're happy to to, to put your name forward when they, when they hear of openings. Uh, and and Josh had been Josh was playing with Sting. I remember running into Josh at Guitar Center of all places. I hardly ever go there. He hardly ever goes there. And uh, he told me at that time he told me he was he was playing with Sting, and you know. Of course, inside, inside, I'm going. Oh my gosh, I would love to play with Sting, and and uh, and I might even even said something like, "Well, if it's ever they ever need a second guitar player, because I know Sting had been with Dominic Miller, his longtime guitarist, for years, years and years, yeah. and I know he wasn't going anywhere. And in fact, what Josh was telling me at Guitar Center is that it was a, it was a four piece band with two guitar players. So anyway, he was telling me about it and how great it was, and and then. Uh, a little bit after that, Josh called me, and I don't know what it was, but he said, "Do you have a minute to talk?" And and I just said, "Shut up." <laughs> I, I, for some reason, I just, I, I just had this feeling that he was about to drop that <laughs> yeah. incredible news, and so I ended up having an audition with Sting. Uh, they were they were just finishing a tour, and they were in New York, so they flew me out there, and it was an incredible audition. And the next day, I got. I got the next day. Um, I think at that time I was, uh, well, okay. So let me, let me backtrack a little bit. You're going to have to edit this. If, you, if you're putting this in print, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. there's a lot of, uh, jig jagged oblique thinking here, but, um, we were, I had auditioned and it went great. And we had a little talk afterwards. We all sat down as a group and, and, and then Sting said, well, you know, you were, you were great. And oh, there's a couple other guys that we've committed to see and, and I say, well, that's no fucking good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he laughed. And then, anyway, so I, I felt it went as good as it could possibly go. And I had a really fun night. I went and hung out with a, a friend from New York and went to see some jazz. And the next morning, flew back home to, to L.A. And as the plane is taxiing in, at LAX, I turn on my phone and I see it. I see a 212 area code number. And I knew that that was Sting's manager's number. So... At that point, I was asked to uh, play at Live Eight. I remember seeing you on it. As a matter of fact, yeah. So that was that. That was the beginning of that. That's a, that, that. My experience with Sting. How long were you with him? Well, we did we did some dates. We did Live Eight. We did some other dates. And then we did a full on tour. And uh, we did some. Well, what we did we we recorded some. We we did a little bit of recording. We did some live dates, and then we did a full-on tour in 2006, which was a, a lengthy European tour during the summer. Mm -hmm. And then after that, some spot dates here and there. Okay. So I have two questions, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on Sting because there's a lot of other things I want to talk to you about. But the first question has to do with that is, what was the audition like? Did they ask you to learn some songs first, some, some particular <laughs> songs, or was it just uh, come and play? Yeah, it was it was funny because the manager sent me. I laugh about it only because I was in a band uh, when I was about twenty years old. I was in a band and we did a bunch of police covers. We were a three piece band, and the bass player sang. So you know, do the math. <laughs> right. So and that you know, the police was like my favorite, one of my favorite bands at that time. So I I knew them. I completely knew the material. So they sent me. The manager sent me. Message in a bottle to learn, <laughs> which I'd known for which I'd known for twenty years. You know, I learned twenty years ago. You know, and I think an, uh, every what was the other track? I think it was three of his big hits, mm -hmm. and that was it. And I already knew him. So it was funny. We were at the audition. We played the songs, and it was it, we just did it one time. And things are fantastic. Is he fancy playing anything else? And he goes, "What would you like to play?" You know, I, I guess he, he got the feeling that I, I sort of knew what. He was about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And he goes, "What would you like to play?" And I and I said, "Anything." I'm somewhat familiar with your catalog. <laughs> <laughs> and he, 
you laugh. Yeah, and then we played another three or four songs. Says that that's it. I've heard enough. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, second question about this then is: Was there something that you felt that you really learned from the Sting experience that you wouldn't have learned any other way? Sensi- high sensitivity to the singer. <laughs> you know, only in the in the musical sense. Just, just you know, because Sting would like to play with dynamics. Sometimes he would like to play with arrangements. Sometimes he liked to play with uh, uh, you know structures of the track. So just just you know, completely being locked in, especially in a live scenario, you know that, that if there's someone out there that's singing, being completely locked into them all the time, hundred percent of the time. You're not you, you, you're doing your job and you're hitting your marks and you're playing your parts, but you're always looking over like, is he going to want to take this this verse down, or is he going to want to whatever? You know what I mean? Just mm-hmm. it's, just just being locked in. But that's cool. I mean. That- that's what playing live is about, and that's what keeps it interesting, I think. Because if you play the same thing every day, the same way, you very well know how that works. You, after a while, you really get bored with it. Doing that, boy, it, it keeps yeah. everybody on their toes. It's dynamite. That's that's exactly right. And I think he always wanted to breathe new life into into uh, the songs. And so we would we would you know we would learn a we would rehearse a song, and then maybe. Uh, at the, the sound check three days later, he goes, I want to change that. And we change it again. We rehearse it and do, do it a different way. He was always interested. We'd always, he's always just interested in trying to see how to breathe new life into his material. Mm-hmm. And so that was, that was just, uh, you, and you always just learn when someone asks you to play something or they want you to want to hear it a certain way, you, you learn something from that. Mm-hmm. And, and I want to say another example of that would be with Beck is a highly, and that's another scenario where I learned a lot from Beck in the sense that we're talking about learning from artists. But, yeah. You know, I, so it was a couple of years touring with him. I learned the, the absolute importance of the, of the details, how every, every little thing makes a difference. You might not think it is in, 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 in the big wash of it all, but every little thing. I mean, I remember there was a rehearsal. He, he asked me if I had a thinner sounding reverb. You know, and I, mm-hmm. I kind of look over my amp. I go, well, there's my amp. There's a spring reverb in it. And it kind of, it's kind of what the reverb sounds like. And he says, yeah, well, do you have a thinner sounding one? And I went, oh, okay. So I realized I needed to, to figure out how to do that. And I ended up using a, a, a pedal reverb that I could sort of dial in the sound. Yeah, I could program a sound. But it was just very de- detailed. He was detailed with everybody and how to play something, how to make it feel how to make it sound. Uh, and, and then of course, in this whole presentation is this whole aesthetic presentation of what people, what, what they wore or, or you know, everything, even, even areas that seemed like chaos were, were perfectly constructed to be along with his aligning with his vision aesthetically. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I have to be, to be honest at, at the beginning, it, it, it rubbed me a little bit of the wrong way because it, up until that time, I'd sort of gone into people's material, them knowing what I did and bringing myself to the role, like in the sense of even in, with, with Sting, he's, the first thing he said to me was, you know, this is not a police cover band. Just do your own thing. Mm. You know, we're, we're with Beck, it was the exact opposite. This is the part. This is the way it needs to sound. This is the way it needs to be articulated. I think, you know, there was, a, there was little, little uh, area for improvisation and, uh, and, and if you did improvise, it had to be again, aligning with the, the aesthetic, you know, that, that all of the details have to make in order to make the whole, the way he wants to hear them, it has to be done. Every little, middle, every little thing has to be exactly right. And that's something that, that really stuck with me as a composer, especially in the area of, of, of making music that had to have authentic, you know, have to be authentic mm-hmm. to whatever the style or genre, you know, if it's guitar, if it's electric guitar, what kind of electric guitar is it? Is it, is it hollow body? Is it an old guitar? Is it a new guitar? What's the amp like? What's, you know, what's, it's every little aspect of it. If you pay attention, it's going to make the music feel a lot more uh, real. And it's the things that people can't really, people that are not musical don't know it, but they feel it. Well, let's go there for a second. When did you know that you wanted to be a composer? 
Was it something that kind of snuck up on you and you got the opportunity, or was it something that you were thinking about for a while? Uh, it snuck up on me. It snuck up on me after, when I was moved when I had moved to Los Angeles. At that point, my my focus was to be a session musician, a session and touring musician, and to continue to write my music, whether it be my own freaky instrumental music or write pop songs or write with people for their records, write songs. It was kind of all over the place, uh, to be honest. But some, of, but one thing that I ended up doing at that time, uh, when I first moved to Los Angeles, is one of the sessions, one avenue of session work I was getting that was, was semi-regular was working with a music, uh, a jingle house that wrote commercials for television, that wrote music for te television commercials. And I started playing guitar on them, but then they, they see at that time I'd, I'd already had some success with, with the, the band. I was the band I was with Lisa Tag and the biggest hit we had, I co-wrote. So I think some people in the know knew that I was a writer, that I wrote music. Mm -hmm. And so I was asked, Hey, we know you write music. You want to try your hand. We, we've got this uh, Reebok. We, we've got this Reebok. Uh, we were awarded to, to do the music, but we got a couple of guys that are working that are within that company vying for that spot. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like the, in, in, uh, in competition to try to, to get awarded it. So I, I did that and ended up getting some pretty big ads. It was a Reebok and there was a Cadillac and there was, you know, a number of them. And I just found that I liked the process of making music to visual, you know, the visual medium. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I I was always a film buff and, and always loved hearing how the music functioned in, in films, but more like admiring it from afar. I'd, I'd never studied it, so to speak, but I'd always listened and absorbed it somehow. And in fact, when I, when I moved to Los Angeles, one of the first things I did is just being in, 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 interested in, in orchestral music in general. I took an orchestration class at UCLA and learned it was a great teacher there, Scott Smalley. Uh, he probably still teaches and, and took an incredible orchestration class. And, and that was before I was really doing anything in the composing world. I, I just wanted to do it. I just wanted to learn how to do it and, and incorporate some of that in my own music, probably more primarily at that time, my instrumental music, which has all kinds of elements of jazz and, and some classical and whatnot. So it was starting with jingles, and then I started uh, working with a composer who, you know, I'm going to, okay, so let me backtrack a little bit. One of the sessions I was, it was actually another Matt Wallace session, and it's that same session I told you about, the band Khalil with, with Josh Grease. Yeah. At that same session, you know, I'm confusing things. Okay. You're going to have to edit this pretty severely. Yeah, no problem. Uh, one of the, one of the sessions I did with Matt Wallace was a band, an English band, and the bass player was this young guy. It was his second session, his second professional session. This young guy named Mike Elizondo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so you know, this is this is early on, very early on in his career, and he was just a real, just a an incredible bass player and and just a, a great musician. And um, he recommended me to a composer who was looking for a guitar player, a composer named Ed Schirmer. Oh, I know Ed. Oh, okay, great. I've done work with Ed in the past, yeah. All right on. So yeah. I did several movies with Ed, and then and around, around, around that time, I'd also uh, done a, um, this, this record with Matt, with, 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 uh, with Mike, and then... I don't know why it's so foggy in my brain right now. I've told the story a hundred million times, but for some reason today I'm, I'm screwing it up. One of the sessions with, with Matt Wallace and Mike Elizondo, the central artist, one of the, one of the key songwriters of that band, he's a programmer and keyboards and just kind of a jack of all trades kind of guy, a great, really good musician. And I, I started working with him on some of my jingle stuff because he was really good in certain areas that I wasn't. And, uh, and then shortly after that, he called me to help him score a film. 
he was friends with John Favreau and, and Vince Vaughn, and they were doing a movie, and they asked their buddy to do the film, and that buddy thought that that I would be a good a good uh, partner to do to do the music with. So wow. we co-composed a movie. We co-composed this movie called Made, a small independent film. Mm -hmm. So I had one independent film under my belt, and as I started working with Ed Schumer, after after a little while, he called me and said that uh, his wife, who was a Universal Music executive, uh, her workmate was a was a vice president of music and needed some guitar on a project, his own personal project. So through that connection, I ended up with that gentleman in my studio and uh, recorded some guitar for him and then sent him off with a, a, a demo CD that had my commercial stuff and my music from, from, from made. And from that, he, he liked what he heard and he called me back and he put my name in the, in the, in the pile <laughs> for uh, a universal film that, that they were looking for some, some rock type music, uh, some additional music for this film called Kicking and Screaming. It was a Will Ferrell movie. Mm -hmm. And he asked if I was interested in trying my hat at it. So I, I wrote up some, some material and it ended up in the film. And one of the producers was Judd Apatow. Shortly after that movie came out, Judd signed a deal with Universal as a director to his own, his own movies. And, you know, through the, through the, support of this universal executive i end up uh, writing some music for judd as a as a as a demo for a 40 year old virgin and somehow i don't know how this happened but i got the job you know basically an unknown name you know and he's, this was a, a a motion picture you know a, a full-on feature film yeah and uh, i got the gig and and that movie really started my career because it came out and it was, it broke all kinds of records. It was number one at the box office for two weeks in a row. So I sort of some degree skipped to the front of the class <laughs> Yeah. inadvertently. You know, it's good. This plan that's just all lined up for me, you know, and for, for Judd. And that began, uh, that began a series of films with, with Judd's production company. Second movie I did was super bad. It, it also was two weeks at number one in a row. So my first two major films were two, two number ones back to back for two weeks in a row. So that pretty much sealed a, a cemented a career in, in film composing for me. And and as the demands of the music changed, I I, I changed with it. And and if there was something I wasn't quite sure how to do to do, I would just figure it out and, and do it. And so suddenly I was working with orchestras and orchestrating and, and, uh, and it just, just kind of grew and grew. And the orchestration class really came in handy then. That, that came in handy, but I also was smart enough to get an, an orchestrator too, just to make sure everything I was doing was right. Mm -hmm. And also to supplement where, where, where things were needed, especially when things got really busy and I started working on multiple projects. Like you just can't do everything yourself. Yeah. 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 But at the beginning I wanted to do everything because I wanted to learn how to do it, so I did as much as I could. You know, what's interesting in all this is the fact that there are so many people that are trying to crack that industry, that part of the industry, and it just goes to show you that it's, now obviously you have to have chops, you have to you know, be good at what you're doing, but there's a lot of people like that, but it really helps to network and really know people because uh, otherwise it's a lot tougher, it's for sure. Exactly right. You know, you have to network, you have to put yourself out there, but you also have to have, you have to have, be lucky enough to be involved with successful projects. Yeah. You know, there's a, when I, when I did made, I tried to get a, an agent, uh, and nobody, no one wanted to meet with me. No one wanted to represent me. I couldn't get arrested. <laughs> now, was I, how much more talented was I, uh, at once when I did 40 year old virgin than when I did made, I don't know, probably this, uh, maybe I learned a few things, but you know, I went from nobody wanting to represent me from to everybody wanted to rep everyone. I mean, every major agent was, was pursuing me Yeah. because I happened to be involved with a very successful film. Yeah. So it, it you know, there, I don't, I mean, I take credit for the work and for my, my, uh, 
sticking with it and, and, uh, and being dedicated to what I do. But when it, and it comes a, to a career in composing, you really do have to have some success for people to want to call you back. Okay, now that said, if we fast forward to today, you were telling me that when we were sitting in the airport, I think, going to GearFest or coming from Gear, well, I was going to GearFest, you were telling me that you're also doing television now as well. You have a couple of television projects. Yeah. So how different is that from doing film for you, or is it basically the same mindset? Well, a lot of the prop, the differences are are, te- are just technical in that you, you you have a schedule, and you know at the end of a movie you've got that's when you need to be completed. You know, you work on it for anywhere from two to three to four to five, whatever months. And you could be tweaking the, the first cue three weeks before the movie comes out or whatever, a month before the movie comes out. But in t- with, with television, you know, it's, it's going to be, it's going to go on the air. <laughs> yeah. So you've got to follow schedules. You've got to finish the first episode and then you go to the next one. It's done. It's in the can. It's a little different with streaming entities because with streaming into these, it's all, it, it's all put out at once. Uh, in the case of Netflix, for example. Mm-hmm. And so you could go back, you could go back to the first episode and tweak it if you needed to, to make it stronger. But right. it's, it's, it's more like this, the, the deadlines are different. Yeah. Uh, and then sometimes, you know, you know, usually at least with the, the TV I've done, you know, I've, I've yet to do a TV show where I can have a 70 piece orchestra. You know, I, I, there are some people that get to do that. I, I'm just not one of them yet. I don't think many these days, <laughs> from what I hear. Yeah, there's not not many, but uh, but, they, but they do. So you know, so it's they're the same in certain ways, but different in others. Okay, last question, because I, I could talk to you all day. I have tons more questions, but I don't want to keep you too much longer. What's the most fun thing that you do? Because I mean, you do a lot, and you're really good at a lot of different things. What's the most fun to you? What can't you wait to do? Uh, hearing orchestra play your music. Mm, yeah. Hearing, you know, that's the, that's the best. That's the biggest rush. You know, there's that. There's also standing on stage with Sting, playing to you know tens of thousands of people. We played one gig. We played to almost 500,000 people. Wow. It was a free show in Warsaw, Poland. Wow. Yeah, it was like 400 and something thousand people there you know live eight was a was a huge thrill gigantic thrill you know i'm just <laughs> playing playing sting and then you know paul mccartney walks up and talks to sting and i'm just standing there like okay this is you know <laughs> um, i i feel like a kid from san jose you know like what what am i doing here yeah there's a moment like that but yeah you know an incredible live show is a huge thrill and then playing Hearing orchestra play your music, I'd say those are the um, the two greatest career highs. Okay, one last question: What's your favorite instrument? We'll get geeky for a second. Are you talking about guitar? Yeah, or, or any anything. Any. Well, it could be anything, but you're a guitar player, so I figured you probably have a favorite guitar. Yeah, it's it's changes because nowadays everything I do is is in service of of a music, and and as I was talking about. You know, with Beck and the importance of 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 casting your musical instrument, <laughs> yeah. it, it's always changing. But if I had to pick one, I would. If I had to pick one, it'd probably be a, tel- a Fender Telecaster. Really, you're a Tele guy. I didn't realize. Yeah, yeah, I would have to say. Real men play Telecasters. They're not easy, especially live. Yeah, that's what I play live. Wow. You know, but it's also I couldn't. I couldn't live without a 335 or, or a, uh, you know, or a Les Paul or, uh, you, you know, a silver tone or a, <laughs> on and on really. What's your favorite amp? Probably a desert Island. If I had to pick one, it'd be an AC 30. Oh, okay. Top boost. Uh, either way. Okay. Or, 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 or you know, hmm, it's, t- it's kind of a toss up between that and a, and a Fender Princeton. <laughs> I love it. Like a, a a mid '60s Fender Princeton. That's sort of my main re- recording amp. If it's clean mm-hmm. and cleanish, yeah, I tend to like the old stuff. 
Thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyoinnercircle.com. To listen to other episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com and select the podcast tab, or go to bobbyoinnercircle.com, or you can find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Mixcloud, Google Play, and now Google Podcasts. At bobbyosinski.com and bobbyoinnercircle.com, you'll also find a sign-up form for my newsletter and for alerts for new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski. I will see you next time. Yeah.